Sandhya Kaushika. To introduce Dr. Kaushika to the audience, may I now invite retired Assistant Commissioner Navode Vidyalaya Samiti and Consultant Vigyan Jyoti at NBS Headquarters, Dr. D.K. Modi, sir. Modi, sir, please. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to the team of American India Foundations for organizing the event and giving me the opportunity to introduce the today's guest speaker, Dr. Sandhya Kaushika, an eminent Indian neuroscientist. In fact, it is a matter of great pleasure, pleasant and proud to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Kausika. She is an eminent Indian neuroscientist, currently works as an associate professor in Tata Institutes of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Her main area of interest is regulation of actional transport within nerve cells. She is a recipient of the International Early Career Award by the Harvard Hughes Medical Institute, USA. Dr. Kausika earned her BSc and MS from Maharaja Shayaji Rao University of Baroda and received her PhD in cell, cellular and molecular biology from Rindias University. Her postdoctoral training was at Washington University in St. Louis. Prior to her current appointment at Tata Institution, Fundamental Research Mumbai, she was a faculty at the National Center for Biological Science, Bangalore. In addition, her group takes several interdisciplinary approaches, working with other groups to develop radius biological and mathematical models for a comprehensive understanding of this neurological process. Madam, on behalf of NVS, on behalf of Vijay Scholars, and on behalf of American India Foundations, I extend my warm welcome to Dr. Osika, Madam. I would like to apprise you, Madam, Vigyan Jyoti Program is a flagship initiative of Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, with the collaboration of NVS in order to promote STEM education among girls students, especially from rural areas, which is the need of the hour for the growth and development of science and technology in the country. At present, we have 250 GMEs as knowledge center of Vigyan Jyoti program across the country. Vijay scholars are highly talented and having tremendous potentiality to do something in the field of science and technology, engineering and mathematics. I do hope that today's interaction will definitely inspire them, motivate them to study neuroscience. When we talk about neuroscience in our country, when we talk about traffic jam in the brain, we do not find any person better than Dr. Kausika, madam. Madam, I don't want to take much of your time. The students are eagerly waiting to listen to you. Now I would like to hand over to Sonal. Sonal, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to the session, ma'am. Uh, before we start the session, I would like to request all the participants to keep themselves on mute. And uh, meanwhile, you can uh, open your videos, but keep yourself on mute. And all the questions, uh, the, all the doubts that you would be having in the session, 
we will address it after the session once the session gets over so welcome again ma'am welcome to the session so uh, dk modi sir has given the introduction of your journey your expertise everything but now we would like to hear from you your educational journey like from school to college and from where you got interest in pursuing science so we would like to hear this from you um thank you very much for asking me to come to this forum it's i don't think i have ever spoken to so many people and so many young people so thank you all jnus jnv students for coming for this session and for dst and aif for you know setting up something like this so i was a i was just a normal kid studying in a city where my parents you know my father had a job and i was just studying in a local school which was there in the city and very early on i used to read a lot of things i was always interested in i don't know experimenting and taking apart things and you know just just a normal thing in my mind uh, to do those kinds of activities and um, i think when i was quite young i decided that what i wanted to do was science and what i wanted to do was some kind of research in genetics and in that area of biology i'm not saying i knew a whole lot i think i was too young and very naive and i didn't know a whole lot but i read whatever i could so because of this interest i actually after my 12th decided to do a bsc and msc and there was some professor who we ran into who was from isc who said that if you want to study anything biology you should know chemistry so i did a bsc in actually in chemistry in a university where my parents my my father was working in baroda spal vadodara now and i just went to the local university i didn't go to any place very fancy and but when i finished my bsc then i did a msc in the same university maharaja sayaji rao university it's a state university it's not one of those famous universities that like iit or anything that you know people went to so i think a lesson for everybody here is that you can actually start locally in what resources are available and then grow from there so there were very nice biochemistry there was a very nice biochemistry program that was when actually um jnu started what were these msc biotechnology programs but i didn't get in through that entrance exam i only got in through the biochemistry entrance exam in the university in ms university but it was a very nice department and uh, i went there for two years and then i think i had a piece of luck and the piece of luck was twofold both in my bsc there were one or two teachers who were very good and in my msc there were many teachers who were quite good and i applied for a summer training program in ccmb i was lucky enough to get in this is center for cellular and molecular biology it's a tier 1 research institution to this day in this country and i was lucky enough to get in and it's when i went there that i realized that people do a phd outside the country i had not even thought about it i was just a, you know a kid who was growing up in a smaller city in india and when i saw that i asked my parents if they would uh, you know be okay if i applied and they were very supportive so i took all the exams that you have to take and then applied and i must say that i was extremely naive i didn't know what it took and i applied to some eight or nine places it was too expensive to apply for too many more places but i applied to about eight or nine places oh, and yeah and then i saw that i asked my parents if they want to you know take five plan and they were very supportive so i did all okay <laughs> so that sounded like an echo and and then i got into two places one actually where i ended up going i got in through uh through the wait list i didn't even get in like immediately so again i think here's a lesson so lesson over here that you should not get discouraged and uh, 
Then I had a fabulous PhD in the United States of America. It was my first time, you know, living in another country. There were, of course, challenges that came with that. Everything was very new. But I had an absolutely marvelous time doing a PhD. And then I, and that PhD after doing chemistry and then biochemistry was actually in molecular, it was called molecular and cell biology, but I did a lot of genetics there. And then I did postdoctoral training, which was in cell biology. And then I looked for an academic position where I could continue to do research and join TIFR. First, I was in Bangalore in NCBS, and then I moved uh, to the main campus, which was in Mumbai. In both places, I ran my lab. So that's my educational journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And one thing you told that never get discouraged. This is a lesson for all our students and for yes. us also, like not to getting discouraged any time, like from the failures and everything. So, ma'am, we uh, will proceed with the next question. We would like to understand your work in neurobiology, your involvement as a neuroscientist, and uh, what are your work so? So, I have a I have a presentation which I can share. Yes. Um, is that all right? Because I thought that I I think actually what I thought I would do when I share this presentation is also give you a sense of how scientists approach problems. And I think if you get a sense of how, if you get a sense of how scientists approach problems, I think you yourselves, each of you will sort of examine the natural world around you and ask yourself questions. And I say this because there are many high school students who are in cities who will write to me. And in fact, I have mentored high school students in my lab who will come and say, Humko aapke lab mein experiment karna hai, that I want to do an experiment in your lab. And, you know, and for people, especially who are in rural areas, this is not a possibility easily to go to a big city to afford all of that and find a place to stay. And, and what I want to share with you today is actually a way of examining questions, which is common, which is, you know, which is how scientists approach questions. And the approach is one where we use scientific method. So let me just share my screen. And I request students who have questions to please um, feel free to ask me questions because it's otherwise you will just... You may, I hope you don't find it boring. <laughs> okay, so let me share my share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, so what I'll talk to you about, and I think probably every single person here knows what a neuron is and what a brain is, right? And these are drawings by Ramoni Santiago Cajal, who many years ago, over a hundred years ago, figure out how individual neurons look. And he developed a way of staining uh, the brain, different kinds of brains and figured this out. So how does a scientist approach uh, any question, right? The first question you ask is, why does something work the way it does? Or why do you want to study that question at all? And then you ask, how does, how does one study it? And then finally, you discuss what is it that you found? And I would say these three questions of why, how, and what you found out is at the heart of all kinds of scientific inquiry, whether you do physics or you do biology, the approach is the same. Okay. So why should we bother studying the brain? And I see the very simple and most important reason is actually comes from the lived experience that we as humans have, right? When we look, when you look at these pictures and let me just maybe put a laser pointer. When you look at this picture, you'll realize, oh, this is a sun. It's so pretty and we enjoy sunrises or sunsets. It's at least me, I have a lab right on the sea face and everybody at TFR in Mumbai can enjoy the sunset. When we feel pain or 
you know when we are drinking in the morning some people might think they want coke i want coffee somebody enjoys orange juice and of course when you have any sort of physical activity so what the brain allows you to do is perceive your world around you be that color be that physical internal processes where you feel pain and hunger thought where you take decisions as to what you want to do and of course then when you take a decision you have an action for instance i am moving my hand and i can see that i'm moving my hand and i'm thinking i should not move my hand and so i might put my hands down and that's an action right but the other context that is to understand the brain and the nervous system just for its own sake but the other equally two important context one is injury which many people especially in india road accidents are extremely common right and lot of people get seriously injured in that they often have injuries in their spine in their brain and here is superman you might have seen the modern superman but this is a superman who sort of played that role in the 80s he fell not in, he didn't have an accident with a car he had an accident where he fell off his horse and he injured his spine and essentially was then wheelchair bound for the rest of his life till he died right because your nerves don't regrow and reconnect and therefore you lose all ability to in to move around and you lose a lot of function and some of you may have heard of pay patients who have stroke maybe your grandparents or your great grandparents have had stroke or somebody in your family has had stroke and they lose the ability to move their hand or speak clearly and these are all things that come from injuries in the brain so there are two reasons to study the nervous system just for obviously from the way we interact with the world and respond to it but the other thing is also injury but the third thing is things like alzheimer's disease or dementia right now india has a very large old population and it's just going to increase so as people live longer it's very very common for people older people to develop dementia and other kinds of neurodegenerative diseases and that also becomes a very powerful reason to see um to sort of study the nervous system so what is the brain made up of the brain is made up of cells called neurons let me close this because it's constantly here all right so the brain is made up of neurons and in this case you might have seen pictures of neurons in your school textbook this is a very beautiful picture where you see this neurons just squiggling around and here is the diagram of a human being showing all the neurons and what you see is that they all connect to all different parts of your body what the nerve system allows you to do is sense information in your environment integrate that information and transmit a response so for instance if you by mistake touch something which is very hot you'll immediately take out your finger right and that's your sensing you're integrating that information and removing it immediately but on the other hand if it's a garam garam hot cup of tea and you want to hold that especially if it's winter and cling to it and drink it slowly then you're going to say i don't care it's hot i can bear it i'm going to drink it right so that sense the heat integrate that information whether you let it go or you continue to hold it and transmit that information through an action that's all part of what the nerve system does so if you look at these wires you can quickly see these are called axons and you don't need to remember any details okay it's just all i just want you to take home conceptually how the nervous system works you can look at these wires and there was this absolutely beautiful and very simple experiment done here again you sort of think about experiments in a very simple way and the simple experiment which was done by paul weiss was an incredible scientist actually 
I've just recently come up and, you know, come across more of his work and I think so insightful. And by the way, very insightful scientist who, you know, was very respected at that time, but you don't hear about him as a Nobel Prize winner. But he did a very, very key and important experiment. He said, you have these wires. Let me do a simple garden hose experiment. Let me try a knot around it. Now I want you to think about if you have a, you know, water to water your plants in the school garden or in your house and you open the tap and you have a flexible pipe and you squeeze it, what will you see? You'll see the place you squeezed right beside it, it will swell up because the water is accumulating there and there is flow taking place. So he had the same idea. And when he did that experiment, he showed that flow happened from both directions in these neurons. One was coming from what is called the cell body, going up to the communication hub, as well as going back. And that was really remarkable. So what happens inside these wires is flow. Now let's take a deep dive and say, this is what you look at the at a macro level. When you go down deeper, you can look inside and use these special microscopes called electron microscopes. We can really magnify things which we cannot see with our eyes. And you will see all of these filamentous structures and these other kinds of, uh, you know, what are, you might have heard of mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell and vesicles that are all inside the neuron. Okay, they are inside these little pipes or axons. So they were very curious and said, do we know how these things move around? Are these the objects that move around? So let me just show you some very nice pictures. You can take these neurons and just peel off the upper membrane. And what do you see? You see things like mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell moving around. This is a vesicle, but in general, let's just call it cargo. These are all cargo that move around. Now look at this. You take the same preparation. Now you blow it up some more and separate it a little bit. In fact, you can even see it here. You can see these little roads like structures. And what you see is these road-like structures, which are cellular roads, which are called microtubules, on which these various cargo are moving. So inside neurons, there are things which are moving, which is really, really exciting that it's not static. Things are zipping past here and there. In fact, you know even more information that this movement takes place by little proteinaceous engines called motors. And this is the way they work. You can just watch it. That's your cargo and that's the motor which is working on the road that I just showed you. And it's stepping hand over hand and walking down this little road, dragging this big load. And this is happening in your cells, in your neurons, as I am talking to you. It's not something which stops and goes. It just happens all the time. And in case any of you are interested, this is a really awesome video to watch. The inner life of the cell, and they have a version which has music in the background, you should really enjoy it. It sort of shows the whole thing about how it works inside a cell, not a neuron, but a cell. It's one of my favorite videos. Okay, so motors move cargo inside cells. So if there are all these things moving around inside any cell and inside neurons, are there any traffic rules in the brain? Why should we even think there should be traffic rules in the brain? You remember how I showed you all of these are wires? Those wires are very thin. And so the obvious question that comes up is how do things move around here? And here I'll show you a little video which is central to how to address the question. And the idea is that if you're curious about something, for instance, I was curious about how is it that transport occurs in neurons, then you need a way to see that transport, right? The why question drives the how question. And this is, we look at a new organism called C. elegans. We trap it. We turn on some kind of particular wavelength of light. 
And this is in a living animal. You can see transport of cargo going in both directions. This cargo, which I often say is a running a marathon in the brain. Once you finished your job, you let it go again and the animal is fine. Okay, so I will escape from my pointer and play this again. We'll just see it pause. You'll see cargo moving in both direction. The other thing you will see is this, there are some cargo which don't move at all. Can you see this hand when I say the cargo that don't move at all? I hope you can. Okay, good. So you know that there is cargo that's moving and cargo that's not moving. So what were the findings that we had? And this is what I'm describing to you is actually, I'm a biologist but I worked neurobiologist, but I worked very closely with a theoretical physicist. So it's very important to be able to talk and interact with people outside your realm of specialty. And often it can really enrich the way you think about questions and how to solve them. So what we saw was the following, where there are places which are crowded in the neuron. Like if we go to a market area, there'll be a lot of things. No, There'll be cycles. There'll be people who are sitting on the side of the road and selling things. And think of it like that. This green stuff is a crowded area in the neuron. What ends up happening is cargo comes and stops over there. And it's not able to go anywhere. We'll keep watching. And we we'll look at another example. Here are two cargos which are coming across from each other and they will then dash with each other. As it plays again, you will see that. And then maybe there's some movement taking place right in this region. I hope you saw it here. Right? So you have different kinds of behaviors which all of us are very familiar with. We all drive on Indian roads. You have all of these things. People sit... I, the most frustrating thing if you're an Indian driver is how people will stand in the middle of the road and decide to have conversation with somebody else on the other side and the whole traffic is building up in the back. And that's exactly what's happening in neurons. They are dashing with each other. They are stopping. They don't care. Other things are trying to get past and move. So are these very universal rules? The fact that, you know, things can come and halt. Here is an example which comes from ants, which is not as small as cargo in the brain, which is nanometer in size, right? They're very, very small. Ants, all of us can see them. But if there is an ant in front of it, these other ants cannot go ahead. And we all have these experiences. So there is one unbreakable rule. And my lab also does a lot of lab art. You can go to my lab's website and you can see it. And here's a, here's a bit of art. We shall not budge if there is crowding in an axon or a lot of things which are just completely jammed up. Then there is no space in front ahead. You cannot move ahead. And therefore you have essentially what you have is a traffic jam. So your neurons are like Indian roads. You have traffic jams that are present inside your neurons, just as you have traffic jams on the road. Okay, if we have traffic jams in neurons and inside the road, how can we get past it, right? Because it's very important that you continue to maintain flow. In fact, in many experiments done in many other labs, including in mine, we know that maintaining the flow of cargo in neurons is very important for the neuron to be healthy. In fact, in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, what you see is that this movement is affected and that I will not talk about it today. So you know that you have to maintain this. How can you maintain this flow? There are two strategies. And again, if you're a driver on Indian roads or a passenger on Indian roads, you've all had this experience. The first way to escape traffic jams, and this is work which has done, as I said, with a physicist, is to make a local decision. So supposing you are driving and you want to know you, you 
you want to go somewhere or not. Now you look and see Google Maps and you'll say it's a red, I won't go, or it's green, I will go. But 20 years ago, there was no Google Maps. Your neuron doesn't have Google Maps. So what do you do? You will leave, but you will make local decisions. And it's exactly what cargo in neurons does. If you don't make a local decision, when you hit a traffic jam like this cargo, you'll come to a halt. Nothing will happen. Look at this thing. It's walking. It's a very nice, free. It has space on the road. It comes. But it's reached a jam. It comes to an end. How will you get out of the jam? You have to take some decision. One decision, a local decision, could be to change the lane of movement. And that's exactly what these examples are. That they come to an halt and then you take a decision and move across and go somewhere else, right? So we all do that. If there is a jam in front of us, you see if the neighboring road is there or you take some diversion and you go into another lane. So that's one way of solving the problem. What I call escaping traffic jams by taking local decisions in space. And the second example is you can escape traffic jams and here are these green things are the jams and the red is the vesicle and you just see what it's doing. It's going, it'll come here. You can just watch it going back and forth, it goes back and forth, back and forth, and eventually it'll come out of it. So what is this strategy? It's saying, oh, there's a traffic jam here. Let me come back after some time and see if the traffic jam has gone away. This would be the equivalent if you came out, you saw all this traffic jam, and your mother who's in the car or your father said, oh, this is a great time. Let's just pull over, go and finish this shopping. Shopping, when we're doing shopping, this traffic jam will clear up a little bit, then we will go. So that is you're escaping your traffic jam by sampling that same space over a different time. Okay. And that's exactly what you're trying to do here, that you sample that same space in a different time and then get past it when that traffic jam sort of relaxes a little bit or traffic congestion relaxes a little bit. Is this universal? Let's look at ants. And what do ants do? They do the same thing. When they all pile up like this, the way they get back is they start reversing and they start going back. So the ability to do reversals or sidestepping onto another road is a very, very critical way of bypassing traffic jams. Where there is one more way which you can use to bypass traffic jams. And that you can escape it by doing something known as hopping. Which is, if you have traffic jams, think of Batmobiles in Batman. If you've ever seen little clips on, on YouTube, if you've not seen the movie, then you're walking like this, you see obstruction and you fly and go past that obstruction, right? If you can do that and people have flying cars, that's great. We still don't have that. But that is a strategy that happens inside cells where protein molecules, when they come up with an obstruction on DNA, can hop over their obstruction and land again in a, another region. And that's how, for instance, this group thinks that that uh, you can have movement of proteins along DNA. So what did we learn from our work? And I'm not giving you all the details because it's not necessary. What we learned from our work was that traffic jams are a feature of how the design principles of an axon are. It's not a bug. It's not a problem. It's a feature of it. If you have narrow roads, you will have traffic jams. And you have one unbreakable rule and it makes complete intuitive sense. And the unbreakable rule is if there is someone in front of you, you cannot go ahead. And there are many, many strategies to bypass traffic jams. I told you some, which is you can just take another road if it is available or you can do reversals or you can wait in the side and then do reversals and sample that space again or which will not happen in neurons, the hopping techniques. But there are many features and these are universal rules. They apply to cargo inside neurons, they apply to proteins moving in DNA, and they apply to ants and human beings. 
So we have universal principles of regulating traffic and movement across all lens scales. So this is just one tiny part of what we do. And what we do, this kind of work is extremely relevant to human disease. In fact, there are patients uh, one of the other projects that we do, we look at patients who have mutations in genes, which leads to what are called KIF-NA pathies. And in fact, recently, a whole collection of patient groups got in touch with us from the US to ask us to explain our work to them to see if it was relevant for, you know, their young children who are suffering these diseases. This kind of work, which I described today, is very important for neurodegenerative disease. So basic fundamental research gives you insights across scales, across all kinds of creatures and molecules to understanding principles which are universal, but also can have tremendous benefit. And the people who did the work are this amazing girl gang of two PhD students, Amrita, who just left, Parul, who graduated a while ago and now runs, she's an entrepreneur and runs an educational startup. An MEC student who's now doing a PhD uh, between Oxford and KU Lewin and a postdoctoral scientist um, called Kausalya Murthy and my collaborator who's a physicist, Gautha Menon, who was with IMSC but now with Ashoka. And I'll stop. I can take more questions. This was my training, which I already shared with you and you know all the difficulties I had in my way. And I just want you all to think that, you know, you don't need some fancy lab to do experiments. You can just do it in your house. You can do small observations. You can look at plants grow. You can look at nails grow. You can look at how ants behave. You can do lots of things. Look and tap into your local resources. And you have tremendous ability. The point is to have fun and not become start constantly worrying about career, career, career. Because if you have fun, there are some things which come naturally and you will still have an incredible journey with a lot of joy instead of a lot of tension and stress. At least that's my view. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Like I would have never thought that neurons may be itni sari hoti hai that we have studied in class 12 or 11. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, ma'am, we may did studies uh, like you have done the entire thing and studying neurons and all this would not have been easy. Like you'd have faced various challenges in your journey. So some of the challenges that you'd like to share with our students and with us so that we can understand how difficult this journey was or how did you overcome these challenges? Well, I already told you like, you know, some of the challenges I had and how luck played a tremendous part at one point in giving me a break. But I think the challenges come in many fold. And, and here's where I think the single biggest thing we all need as people in this world who have to live is something called, don't be afraid of failing. And you must have resilience. You fail once, you try again. You try a different way. You learn from that and try better. And I think that's critical for any scientific career or any career for that matter or any scientific experiment. I remember when I was in graduate school, there was this one experiment I was trying for one whole year. And it never worked. So there were two ways to do it. One way will work all the time you know there were no issues but the other way will never work i would keep trying it would never work now you can ask why do you want to try it in both ways it's true that i was advancing my project by doing it the second way but i was like Kaise nahi work hota? i mean it has to work you know i mean how can it not work and then one year later i figured out i was doing something very stupid Okay, which I had not even considered. So this is the simplest thing I can tell you. But there were other times when you say, oh, I think this is a hypothesis. I think this is going to work. And there'll be other people either in your group or other more mature scientists or faculty members saying, oh, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And my own PhD thesis advisor say, hey, it's not going to work. And I said, I'm going to bet you 25 cents, which is, like very little money that I'm right 
And so I went and I did all the experiments. And then when I told her, look, I'm right. And she was like, okay, very good. But then I was right for that particular experiment. But eventually, as I went further into, you know, figuring more things out, she was right. So it was, you know, this is a very natural feeling that you have, that you sometimes feel inadequate, sometimes you fail, but you always have to try. And I think that having that curiosity is what finally gives you the ability to progress. So this is just with experiments, but you can, you know, you sometimes you don't get the admission that you want. You don't get into the college that you want. But if you lead with your curiosity and your joy, doors will open. I am a huge believer in saying you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be somebody, you know, everybody is talking about. If you're interested, work hard, don't fear failure and willing to keep trying, some doors will open and you will have a very nice rewarding journey doing what you like, be it science or something else, you know, whatever it is. At least that's what I feel. Great, great ma'am. This was a great learning indeed for me and all the students also. So uh, this is my last question. And after that, uh, I'll hand over this to the students. They'll ask their doubts. But my last question is, uh, like, what is your vision for the students in India towards STEM careers, especially for girls? Like you have, yeah. I think that, I think STEM careers can be extremely rewarding. And these are the reasons why they are rewarding. I think it is a career in which one day is not exactly like another, right? Because you are always trying to find something out. So you may have a period of, you know, maybe 15 days, 20 days, or even six months where you're just doing the same thing and it looks routine. But then you'll have a finding which doesn't fit what you were thinking will happen and everything goes haywire. And then you have to go back to the drawing board. So there is that sense of excitement. And also, even if it is something extremely small, you are sometimes the first person to see that happen in the whole world. So that's really, really exciting. And I think if that is something that, you know, makes you, that's an experience. Once you have it, it's very addictive. But there are these downsides which are also there. And the downsides are that parents also and even students will worry about it is the training period is very long. So you have to do a BSc or to do an MSc or to do a PhD or to do postdoctoral training. And you're not going to earn as much money as some CEO or upper management person or, you know, somebody who is a doctor. Right. But that does not mean that you're poor. It you still have and what you have, which they don't have, is an enormous amount of flexibility. One day you will come to work in the morning and you will not leave till 11 o'clock or you might not even leave the whole day. Another day you will come in the afternoon. And that happens at all levels. It's not just students. You have that flexibility. You have that passion that you bring to what you do. It's never routine. You're always finding out something new. So I think you have to ask yourself if that's what you enjoy. And then once you decide that that's what you enjoy at that time, take your time to make up your mind. It's a career which can be very rewarding. It's also a career that you interact a lot with young people. You're all very young them yourselves. But if you choose this career, most of my daily interactions are people who are in their 20s. I am getting older and older, but I'm always interacting with people in their 20s, right? And or if you teach in college, it could be anybody who's from 18 years on. So I think that if you choose the academic path, then you always have that energy of young people around you, which really keeps you very fresh, engaged. You don't become so stuck in your ways. You don't start thinking like, okay, you know, this is the way I did it. So I'm going to continue to do that. It keeps you young. It keeps you enthusiastic. It keeps you thinking. And I actually wanted to say that if you choose science as a career path, research is not the only way. Even in research, there's academic research like people like me do. But this research in industry, I mean, think about it, all the medicines that you're eating. If you've got some relative who's got blood pressure, he's 
he's he or she is eating a pill against a G protein coupled receptor, which was developed for industry. It was actually started in academia in some research lab and then was purposed in industry. Very important. You have teaching, you have science communication. People work in museums. I have a master's student who decided she works in science gallery. Bangalore as a program managing polarizing science. There's science journalists who write about science. There's science illustrators. There's research management where people come and manage research. If you like the writing and editing part, there are people who help scientists edit and write their own work better. You can become a patent lawyer and the paths to figure out all of this is always look for internships locally and do you like the work? So if you like science and you like that critical thinking process of asking, how does that work? How do they actually figure out? How will you, how did they figure it out as well? How can you be confident about what you found out? Then this path is the right path for you. Come and you're not trapped. There are many, many options at any point you want to exit and try something else. These tools, these intellectual tools, the ability to work in teams, it's not an alone, you know, the way they will show scientists is working on their own and don't talk to anybody. It's totally not like that. You can exit to many, many other careers where your training will be very useful. This is just a subset of them and the most common ones. So I think the prospects are good. They, it is true that in our country, a lot of women who enter doing research, there are some fields like physics and other things which have problems in attracting women to their PhD programs, but biology does not. There is, and there are real challenges sometimes when you have to combine family and family life and those are things as you grow through those challenges you will have to find solutions there are solutions and things are getting better and I think nobody and certainly no young girl should hold herself back from considering a career in science. I think I said more than I should have. No, ma'am, that, that was a great insight. Thank you so much for sharing it. So now I'd like to invite our students. Some of the students have questions. Yes. So I'd like to invite them. We can clear their doubts. So our first student is Sakshi Kashyap, class 12 from JNV Bilaspur. Sakshi, are you there? Yeah, yes, I think so. Afternoon, ma'am. Myself, yes. from JNB Malhar class of class 12. And that neurobiology is considered one of the most toughest branches in biology. So, how did you develop interest in neurobiology? And is there any particular person who is responsible for your interest in neurobiology? Thank you, ma'am. Actually, doing neurobiology was an accident. Um, I thought that people, you know, when I was growing up, genetics was considered very big. Like nowadays, when people will talk about AI, you know, artificial intelligence is very big. They would say genetics is very big. And so I said, oh, that sound. And it sounded like if you did genetics, you could understand the world, certain things about uh, you know human development and other things so i thought oh this will be a very good thing to do but when i did my phd the lab that i chose to uh, do my research in they were doing genetics but they were doing genetics and looking at drosophila which is a fruit fly which comes to your bananas and everything if you leave it out and but she was looking at questions in the nervous system once i saw a neuron under the microscope that's it there was no turning back I just fell in love and you know and I said oh this is so cool this is so exciting and I felt that I could spend my whole life studying it that's the bottom line so there's nothing like no you know, nobody know one person the neuron itself looks so awesome I still feel like that I get all excited ma'am we can see that excitement from your face only <laughs> So uh, the second question is she has she has a follow up I think oh you don't have a follow up okay 
so the other question is from Ashu, class 12th, JNV Rotak. Good afternoon, ma'am. I am Ashu from JNV Rotak. Ma'am, did you face any hurdle while pursuing your career in pure science when most of the parents are very much into professional courses like engineering, medicine, etc.? Thank you, ma'am. My, my dad wanted to me be to be a doctor, okay? But it was a totally lost cause. <laughs> I mean, I... Okay, I, I'll tell you a story. I, I don't think I've ever said it publicly. Uh, maybe in one place. So I... We had to send the forms to, I was in Baroda, I had to send the forms to Ahmedabad to deposit it. And my father was too busy to come with me. So he gave it to somebody who was going. And that uh, gentleman gave it to his wife to deposit. He did medical forms, he submit not do engineering. Ki ki so I, you know, even though I had marks, I could, there was forms that were only not submitted. So what admission will happen? <laughs> no admission will happen. So he was very, he was very uh, disappointed. And I was also disappointed because, you know, if, when you're growing up, many people will come and tell you if you're doing science, or at least in my time, they used to say that, oh, you must not be a good student. That's why you're not going for engineering or medicine. But, you know, there were lots of, of my family members who also knew that I really wanted to do research. I didn't know the exact part, but I knew that I wanted to do research. So after some time, my parents said, oh, jo karna hai karo. see what happens. And I think there were many people who were doubters in my extended family. So when I was doing my MSc, there were some relatives who said, oh, now you will only have to do civil services. And I was like, no, I'm going to do research. And you know, I don't know, I liked it so much. And it was not as if I had great guidance, you know, programs like this did not exist. So you found out whatever you could locally, you ran into someone, they told you do this. That is why the summer training, which I said in CCMB was so important. Without that, I would apply for PhD only in India. And there other students said, why don't you apply to the US? This is what you do and all of that. So okay, okay, I'll apply. And you know, so I think what shows you that sometimes you need a little bit of luck. And if you like what you do, keep doing it as long as you can. As I said, never give up. Just doors will open eventually. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. student is Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I am Vishwati Patel from class 12th science, JNV Surendra Nagar. Ma'am, first of all, thank you for giving such a valuable information to us. Uh, my question to you is, uh, being a neuroscientist, can you give us uh, tips on how to increase our memory power and become uh, more intelligent? As you know, the most obvious question from a neurobiologist is this only. Okay, there's no magic bullet here, okay? I will just tell you something which probably your mom tells you, which is the single most thing. So if you're thinking about how can I do well in exams, how can I remember, how can I remember all the information? Because still in our school, a lot of the curriculum is, you know, remembering things. There is nothing to beat getting enough sleep. Memory, good memory depends on sleep. In fact, this morning we had a talk in our department. Some student was summarizing some of the literature because they do, they work on learning and memory. Students who don't get enough sleep don't remember as much. Like you put in a lot of time, you study, they don't sleep enough. Next day morning, the recall is affected. Sleep enough, eat healthy food, get sufficient physical activity, and learn to manage your stress. These are the three key things to make sure that whatever capacity you have, you learn to use it. But the other thing I'll say, these are this general, what I call general good practices. Your body is a machine. You have to take care of it. You're not going to use your, your car is not going to get abused. No, at some point you'll go and say, usme, usme oil change karna hai, uska ye theek nahi hai, usko. you will look after it. So we have to look after our machine. But the other thing, which is very, very important, I think, is like 
you want to become an athlete, you will go and practice a lot. The mind is a tool that you need to develop and learn to use well. And I think science and studying science is one way to develop that critical thinking. So if somebody comes and say, ye such hai, then you can ask, okay, why are you saying that? What is your evidence, right? If this is the way you found this out, how good was that method to find it out? You found all this information out. Is that the only way to explain that information or is there something else? This is an approach that you have to train your mind to do. And so if you train your mind to do, you can do it well. And there's no reason why it cannot start in young ages. We all do it all the time. We all have critical thinking, no? Nobody is going and sticking their finger in hot fire. But when it comes to more complex information, it becomes much, much harder. And But you have to train your mind. So I don't know if I answered you well enough, but this is the best I could do. Thank you. Thank you, Vishruti. That was a very important question. We all want to know the secret behind increasing our memory power. Thank you so much. <laughs> Get enough sleep. <laughs> Get enough sleep. Uh, the fourth uh, student is Hiyamoni Kalita. She's from class 12, JNB Goalpara. We have, this is the last question. Yeah. Hiyamoni, you are on mute. Your voice is not clear. Can you write the question in the chat box? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll ask the question. Uh, here, Moni wants to ask, what are the qualities we should have in order to pursue research and choose our career as a scientist? I will say the single biggest quality you need is to have resilience in the face of failure. Because you will face failure, okay? When you do experiments or you try to figure things out, your experiments will not work, your ideas will be wrong, and you have to be not get discouraged. You have to come back and be willing to try. That a sense of adventure and willing to try new things, I think are very, very critical to feel happy in a career in science. And I think the first, I think actually both of them, you can't say something unique to science. It's actually unique to any career that you might want to have. But I think science, especially you need resilience and you need a sense of adventure and willingness to try new things. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So any other questions do we have? Sure. I think we are running out of time. So we will end the session here only. Uh, now I'd like to invite Jessly from our team to give a vote of thanks. Jessly, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Sonal. So like anybody else sitting over here, I was keenly listening to you, ma'am. I'm also, I should call myself, I'm also a student of uh, biology and neurobiology was a real, I don't know what, it was like a mystery in front of all of us. So I really wish we had uh, teachers like you who could explain everything that is, I know it was technical, but you put it in a very simple layman's term and uh, we could really relate to it like traffic jam and driving and waiting for it and all those things. So, and this session was a much awaited session after a short break. So we were all looking forward for this session. And I have no doubt in telling you that it was really awesome. So thank you so much from everyone present here from the bottom of our heart.
thank you so much ma'am for the session for spending some time with us and really motivating everyone especially our students so i know all the students are really geared up and they are really inspired or motivated so thank you once again ma'am for coming by and really sharing your thoughts and experience with us thank you ma'am thank you for having me and uh, now i take the opportunity to thank uh, modi sir sanjeeda ma'am minu ma'am and all our uh, all the people who are behind this uh, session and making it a huge success thank you ma'am thank you for taking time from your busy schedule and now i have to thank very important people who made this program real success that is the teachers or teaching and non teaching faculty from all the schools i can see teachers working really hard from adjusting the mic or uh, assembling the kids in their busy schedule i know how busy it is so thank you so much for all the teachers and all the non teaching faculty a big clap to everybody and last but not the least thank you so much all my dear students i can see the hope in your eyes so really as ma'am told us we are not uh, scared of failures we have heard it hundreds of times like do again and again you're not scared you should not be scared of failures but it has become like a cliche dialogue but when it is coming from an expert like you it really matters so uh, as ma'am told there is nothing to be worried like you are from iits or you are from iim you can do really big so thank you for a thank you to everyone who attended this program and thank you sonal you did well thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you ma'am i'll end the session now thank you ma'am okay thank you thank you madam thank you thank you bye bye everybody Thank, Thank you ma'am Thank you ma'am Thank you madam very wonderful session Thank you Thank you Thank you Adhya